Ricky Evershaw now talk about data visualisation. Thanks, Lindsay. I should say, uh, first of all, that I am a Danish woman with a, the name of a British male, so, well, the first name anyway, which is why I've now adapted, adopted the, uh, the female um, isotype icon. It happens all the time. Really don't feel bad about it. <laughs> Um, so good afternoon everyone. I know it's late in the day and I have the last slot and you're probably really warm and full of lots of new information. So um, I've brought along um, a big stack of pictures and some stories um, about data visualization and hopefully uh, it will, you know, lighten your, your mood and, uh, you know, not be so taxing on the brains this late in the day. I'm going to talk about... Um, the route to visualizations that we take uh, within IRIS when we encounter new data, and then I'm going to give you some examples of, of work we've done recently. Uh, first of all, uh, whenever I, I go to talk about data visualization, um, I'm sometimes you know, I'm met with the, the expectation this is a sort of newfangled thing. So I just want to say it's not, it's existed for ages. It precedes Excel by decades, even <laughs> centuries. This is um, a very early example of the Coxcomb diagram. It was uh, created by Florence Nightingale. She was good for a lot of things. She was an amazing woman. And uh, it's from 1856. Um, it, it, it just shows three variables, three types of, of, of illnesses that people died from in the Crimean War. It goes around on the clock, uh, 12 months a year, and uh, the num obviously there's no numbers on it, so that's lacking, but it's still an amazing example of, of an early need to understand you know, proportions. Um, and you just measure from the inside of the circle out, and that's, that's the sort of proportions of, uh, of death. This is a favourite of mine. It makes absolutely no sense on first view. It's an 1880s uh, time uh, schedule um, for trains in France. Um, I know it's confusing. You have the time along, um, the hours along the, the top line, the horizontal line, and then a very, actually, quite a, a nice um, depiction of, of distances or trying to depict distances between French towns down the side. Um, I don't know if it was much in use, but it's still, you know, it's something that's been happening for a long time. When we enter into the last century, uh, we start to see um, the types of data visualizations that are still needed or used today. Um, this is an early version of the now widely used isotype, as you saw in my first slide. It's Dutch, and it just shows the, the occupation that people had in the town of Leiden back in the 1500. So now, now you know that it's not, um, it's not something to be apprehensive about. It's an old art. It's not a dark art. So um, I should say, before I take you through the steps that um, I always take or you know, consider whenever I try and find out how to communicate to a very specific audience, and that is every time you present data visually, it carries some kind of interpretation, and that's, that's worthwhile keeping in mind. Um, not necessarily because you end up skewing ex you know, results, just so that you know, think of it and think of what you have in mind mirrors what you, what you know of your audience and what they might expect. So, this is basic, basic numeric data. It's hot from the database. Um, anybody familiar with the database or somebody who manages it will, will know what this means. And it may be all they need to make sense of it, either find the results that, the result they're looking for, the numbers they're looking for, or even to find, you know, trends. This caters for a very, very small audience, as you know. Going further and sort of organizing a little bit schematically, you put some headings and some labels on, it starts to make sense. Um, yet, as you can see, the numbers are sort of stuck in a big mass in, in the middle. There's no story as yet, so if you're trying to tell an audience something specific, this is not the way to communicate it. However, it might be something that you can share with the data team you're working in that could make perfect sense um, to them. Taking another step, and this is simply cosmetic, um, you stylize it, so you, you organize the, the colors, or this, this is just the, um, you know, putting a bit of grayscale on the months and the towns, um, and making more space for the data itself. It starts being something that you can navigate. And um, this is actually the step at which an awful lot of public data 
stops. This is how it's communicated. This is like, well, here are the results. Let's give it to the public, which is fine. Uh, for any member of the public or any interest groups, etc., um, this sort of information is is what they need to find the details they're looking for, but it's still not really telling much of a story unless you are an expert. You will have noticed by now that this has got nothing to do with social services, this data. It's something that touches us all, which is why you understand when we get to the next step why or how you can, um, you can filter it a little bit more to make it look more nifty and, and make sense of it for other people who are not so data literate. Now, I don't know if you are aware of um, heat map techniques. It's, um, it's what's been applied here. It's like a, a color filter. You take the, the range of the numbers, range, and then this one is then divided into five, so it's every 20% up. And then it's color coded as such. So the, the heat map runs under principle the deeper the color, the higher the number. And usually you see that it runs from you know two, two strong colors, like from red to, to green here. It's just lavender to white, but it works in the same way. So now you can start seeing, you know, seasons, times of year, not to visit certain American towns unless you want to be completely drowned in rain. This is a good step to stop at um, for people who need both numbers and, um, and you know, sort of quick indicators of, of, um, of when, when, you know, things are good and when things are, thing are bad. Yet there are still a big segment of... Um, of the public that falls into a group that really don't want to deal with those numbers. And this is another step that you can take it to. That's the final step I'm willing to go to today. But essentially, you're contextualizing it by using a shape that tells you what it is you're talking about. You're using size and depth of color to indicate the, you know, the saturation, <laughs> literally, um, but the, the, the level of, of rain that's going to be if you go back, when you see there's a key up there in the right corner, four plus, four inches plus, it goes up to something like just under nine and a half. So, I mean, there's a lot of interpretation going into making this. We're considering anything over four to be kind of a bad time to go. So there's a lot of interpretation put in there, but if that's the kind of audience you have, it might be worthwhile going there. You're stating the obvious, which sometimes is what you need to do. Now, I'm going to give you some actual... Um, examples of, of projects that we've worked on. These, the ones I'm going to give you are, have a specific challenge to it. Um, the first one is uh, the Youth Justice Team in Glasgow City Council came to us last year and said, we run this annual report on youth crime. We put an awful lot of money and work into, you know, <laughs> getting, you know decreasing the numbers and that is happening, but the media has always given us an inter terrible name. And uh, we need to find a way of, of communicating better to media. Uh, so they communicate better to the public that actually work is going in there. So this is how they would usually um, present their data. So this is a standard table. It's pretty straightforward to all of you, I'm sure. But there's, you know, to the eyes of a journalist who's busy, there's a lot going on. And, um, you know, although you can see there's a minus in front of most of these numbers for changes, it's not... It's not telling a story. You need to state the obvious. So what we tried to do was help that a little. We did this. Now, there's, there's a flaw too in this, and I'll explain it also. But what we wanted to do was use a type of visualization which is commonly known. There's no excuse for not being able to understand, uh, understand a bar chart these days, certainly not for the media. Seeing that most of the numbers were going downwards, we, we kind of use that as, you know, helping to tell the story. So starting the axis on zero was, was quite nice for the top one. And then having a little glitch in um, public indecency in the second year kind of helps the trustworthiness of the numbers as well. It's not all good news, but it's predominantly good news. A little other way, a little other technique is whenever you, you have these graphs, if you want to say, you know, this is there's a downward trend here, put the number at the bottom. Massages the eye down. That helps. The slight flaw is that we had to work to A4, and you can't, normally you wouldn't put the text like that. You would have put horizontal text for, for it being easier to read, but it's what we had to work with, so that was what we, we settled on. And then we color-coded the, the offenses against the crimes, and then put the totals in a sort of lilac gray. So that's just, this is one way. It's, it's stated in the obvious, but it's a little bit 
it gives a better overview. So back to the graph. There's also the numbers of overall crimes detected, and they're broken down into these awful sounding uh, variables. Now, the, the eyes are drawn to two. If you read this, you go, almost 12,000 crimes and indecencies or crimes and offences in Glasgow. That's terrible. And nearly, well, about 267 attempted murders. That's what is normally reported. So trying to find a way to, to show these proportions and sort of give Glasgow a better image, we did this. Are you familiar with the heat map? I know the, um, the tree map. This is a tree map. It's like a pie chart, but nicer. Um, and it's a lot easier to, to compare sizes of rectangles than wedges in a, in a big cheese. Um, it also accommodates text and numbers a lot easier, and it's easier to colour coordinate. So that's what we did there. And obviously, as you can see, attempted murders is the second smallest. So actually, it's not that bad in Glasgow. And more than half of the crimes and offences happening are, are sort of petty. It's, you know, people being drunk or loud. Um, so that was a way of just trying to use colour color blocks to tell people what the state of, of affairs really was. The one place that the council tried to um, use colour and shapes was, was um, and this was the first year they tried it, was to sort of give them little bursts of information. So this is, if you're going to read anything, just read these. Um, and that's where, where colours and shapes don't really help. It, they're not helping tell the story, so we removed that and we did this. And that was, that was the first page summary. There was nothing else. And um, it just, you know, if you want to tell something and if you, want to, they want, you want people to take it home, just tell it in really big. If it's a number, just give it the, num the, the number in, a, in large letters. And actually, you know, it worked for, for the first time in something like 10 or 11 years. It, it had a positive write-up. So we're working with them again this year to see if we can... Um, Describe the changes from last year even better. Now that we've both um, helped uh, the media understand what the current situation is, but also taught them how to read the graphs. So key considerations for doing something like that. Um, use only the data that you wish to communicate. You can put a table on, but people are not going to zone in on the things that you think are obvious. Your data set is obvious to you. It's not obvious to anybody else. And suit the visualizations to the audience. Work with what you think or you know that they're familiar with and then challenge them a little. That's why we put it in the tree map, and it, it worked. It might not always, but it did in this situation. And say what you want them to understand, and then just utilize, utilize shapes to, to sort of enhance your message, but not, don't put colors on when they're not needed. Uh, something that can help you with this is this really wonderful uh, software tool called Many Eyes from IBM. Now, it's free, so I'm not a sales rep, but it's, um, all it requires is a login. So it's free to sign in, it's free to use, and it gives you some really impactful and beautiful visualizations. There is um, the URLs in the last slide, so you don't have to write it down just now. Okay, next example is uh, for the Scottish Social Services Council. They do, every two years, um, data, a, a report on, on workforce data. And... Um, the challenge we had there was how do we inform the workforce? I mean, the government reads what the workforce consists of, but not a lot of other people do. So that was our challenge. How do we bring, how do we make it interesting for the people that it's about? Um, this is their standard report. Um, this is what it normally looks like. It's perfectly fine. Uh, charts that you can dig into and, and, and find what you need if you're the person that needs information. And a good old pie chart, it's, it's perfectly fine, but it's not drawing out the stories. It's a workforce that has no time and are not really particularly interested in numbers. So we have to find a way of presenting themselves to themselves without these numbers. So we did this. And these are isotypes again, um, using three colors to um, describe the three sectors, public, public, voluntary, and private. And then uh, one man is a thousand people. And um, it's pretty straightforward. It's also it's kind of nicely colored, so it draws the eye in. I mean, visualizations are good for that. They really just make people curious to start with as well. So it can be a great visual aid for that also, and you can make further, further points in the text around it. Uh, this is um, a, 
some <laughs> line graphs they had in in um, in their report, and there's nothing wrong with these. Um, they're just difficult to read, and also there's we found those available to many. So this is by age, employer, and sector, and then there's all this grey background. You'll see that most of the graphs have a sort of peak age, apart from when the the private sector, which is the green line here in the second row, when that's involved, it seems to peak a bit earlier. But actually, overall, the whole age aspect isn't really helping you conclude very much. So we divided it up a little in our um, poster that we made. First of all, we just took employer by subsector. And what you see here is, um, we're just using the same colours again in an isotype man. Um, it's easy to see in which of the sectors that, you know, or of which of the areas of work that sectors dominate. And I think that's maybe, you know, quite a clear story to tell straight away. And then the, for people that are more curious or want the percentages as were in the graphs before, these are listed below. So there's no, there's no data loss. It's just you can make quick um, conclusions um, straight away. And then we put the age further down the poster um, because it is an average of 43. There's a couple of pockets that are actually really uh, small workforces or numbers of work, um, small numbers that have, you know, uh, young ages that are as the average, but overall 43. So we just let that stand alone. Um, and again, you know, that was our interpretation of the data, but we thought that it suited the workforce, that people who, who don't want to deal with data sets. So, Key considerations that we had there is that isotypes are useful for data about people, and it's really useful for people who are scared of numbers. And they, they, they carry a certain flexibility with colour, size, you know, against each other, and the amount that you put up um, next to each other as well. Also, uh, we made, we learned that too many variables in one will just confuse, simplify by just telling one story at a time. And, uh, what you can use for this is um, the iris look tool. My colleague Paul came up with the word look. It's, it's not a particular <laughs> significant in itself, the, the name. This is how it looks, um, front page. We, we have, is in beta at the moment, so we don't have an awful lot of, uh, of things that you can, you can choose between, but there's a, a word cloud um, option, um, and that's essentially you know word clouds, yeah, they put words in, it spits out the ones, the most common ones, no, it takes away things like uh and the, and, but, um, and then the larger the word and the more centrally placed, the more, the more frequently it occurs in the text. So this, it won't tell you the essence of the text, but it will bring together the, the, the words that are most, that I mentioned most frequently, so it gives you that overview. And uh, a lot of people use them for survey feedback, just to sort of go, oh, that's what people are saying. Okay, and then um, the, the number of visual, visualizations that you can create at the moment are these. Um, each of them, you click on them, it just comes up with a description. But it, that's also free, and uh, you just log in and it gives you a, a password. It's easy. The isotypes are only available in, uh, in a few variations at the moment, but the full isotype set, so with the coloured, you know, coloured men next to each other, or ladies, or families, or houses, or whatever else we have, uh, plus the, the graded people uh, will be available for um, the end of this month. So do let me know if you're interested in playing with this. Okay, um, one last little nugget is... Um, <coughs> And a, a, a project that we've been working on, which has nothing to do with numeric data, but it could be used for that. Now, Louise said this morning that there were these accident black spots that have been um, visualized online. Well, they probably use either this tool, which is called Ushahidi, or uh, Google Maps. Both are free, both work really, really well. Obviously, um, a mapping tool is good when there's a geographic context, but um, it could also just be that people put in the location of where they are and they can voice their opinions, they can vote, etc. So you can actually build up data sets from just letting the public loose on this. Now, this very specific project uh, was for Eastern Bartonshire Council um, looking at people with uh, mental health issues and looking at 
the assets or the things that they use in their local community um, that help them and so that the information can be brought both to the local authority, the NHS, to know what to focus on, where people meet, etc., but also to bring people that are maybe stuck at home with their troubles, you know, out to experience um, the helpful network that it had actually been building up. So we didn't put this online straight away. We brought people together over a number of days, and they, they mapped um, all the things that they think are assets in the local community, and they also classified them. And then I had the job of putting all this in, a, in an online map. And you can then, inside, inside the map, you can drill down, so you click on any other little icons, comes up with that, and you click on the heading, and it gives you further information. Um, after I did that, we just um, opened it up so anybody now can contribute assets, they can edit, they can add, they can discuss things, they can upload photos, etc. And it's actually becoming a really nice little database of what's good for people in that area. Um, so key considerations here, it maps provide an excellent context um, and you know, you, you can categorize and you can color coordinate and it's something that people become familiar with really quickly. So they see an icon, it just sort of stays in there. It's that whole media generation. They know, you know, so after a little while, it's just go for the pink or the green or whatever they, they, they need to look at. So that, that works very well. Um, it keeps your data up to date, it keeps the information up to date that you're actually just letting it loose out there in the world. And uh, you can build data sets by, by crowdsourcing. You're familiar with that, sure. Um, and uh, yeah, it makes it av everything reachable, which is, which is lovely. So this is what it looks like, Shahidi. It's, uh, it's an open source tool, so it's free to use, provided you have a place to, um, to host it. If you don't have a hosting facilities, they can host it for a small monthly fee. So I'd, I'd um, and advocate we are using that as well. There is Google Maps. I think it's not as flexible and it's, it's very Google, so you have to stick within. You know, this you can customize it, which is which is nice to do, especially if you're working. You know, like us in the in the social services sector, where you know it it just goes such a long way to customize things. Okay. Just lastly, uh, some useful resources. Uh, it's changed a little, so I can email this out if you want. Um, all the tools I have listed above are free to use. And all the sort of <laughs> inspiration things are just sort of super database or data visualization uh, geeks out there. But they're really interesting to read. And um, they'll point you to, to uh, tools and sources that, resources that you can use. So that's my top 10 for, for getting started. Here I am. So please get in touch with questions, um, anything at all. If you need help, I'm, I'm happy to. Thank you.